Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with state senator and gubernatorial candidate Linda Lopez from the 11th district in Albuquerque, who has served uh, New Mexico in the legislature since 1997 and now chairs the powerful uh, Senate Rules Committee, which among other things is the first stop for a governor's cabinet nominations. The Rules Committee has uh, blocked the nomination of Education Secretary Hannah Scandera, for instance, uh, for over the recent sessions. Um, Senator Lopez is an outspoken opponent of privatization of public services in New Mexico and a public figure I have long admired. It's great to have you with us today in the New Mexico Mercury Library, Linda. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be here and uh, share a little bit of a different perspective maybe as to where and what happens in Santa Fe and uh, maybe what uh, and where our state should be heading. So I'd like to sort of start off by saying, at least to me, it seems pretty clear that New Mexico has been polarized by the Martinez administration in a way that I haven't seen it in 40 years of covering the news here. And I'm wondering, uh, could you uh, describe the stark differences that that seem to be appearing uh, in our state that haven't appeared before? Differences? There are plenty. One of the major areas of concern, I think, to many of us across the state of New Mexico is with regards to our public education system. And when you look at to exactly where and what the proposals have been from the Martinez administration through Ms. Scandera, it, it's the whole Jeb Bush propaganda that comes in about talking where we should what we should be doing with regards to our public education system it's about testing 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 it's about grading our teachers which there's nothing wrong with doing that so we can see exactly where and you know where our teachers are within their expertise and maybe where they need to do some professional development but everything that has been brought forward to us since day one under the Martinez administration has been complete opposite of where many of us in the legislature feels that our education system should be going. Um, you know, when you talk about the grading of the school systems, the ABCDF uh, rating that's come in, that hurts morale. When you look at this whole issue, it's the morale of the students, it's the morale of the teachers, it's the morale of the leadership, and even many of our school board members who may not come out publicly and say so, but there are many of them who are frustrated with exactly what is happening within our education system here in New Mexico. So aside from education, it seems it seems that the Martinez administration, at least from my perspective, is sort of working out of a national playbook, if you will, a kind of an ALEC playbook in which they're moving to privatize everything they can get their hands on. Mm -hmm. When you look at a when you look at an education system which is really designed to prepare young people to live in the world as citizens, rather than to live in the world as uh, little test-taking ciphers. And when you look at the behavioral health, uh, uh, a recent issue, which I'd love you to address at some point here today, um, I'm, I'm concerned about why can't we generate ideas in New Mexico? Why can't she generate ideas in New Mexico? And if, they, and if we could and did, what would they be from this environment? You ask a good question with regards to what can we do with our own expertise here in the state of New Mexico, which we have many. During my 17 years in the legislature, I've met so many wonderful, dedicated, educated, professional people here in the state that we have a wealth of talent that are not being tapped by this current administration. And again, I go back to the issue on education. Many of the um, issues, many of the ideas, many of those who are coming to supposedly train and work with our uh, public school teachers, they're from out of the state. And yet when you go back and look for information, we have programs here at the University of New Mexico, New Mexico State University, New Mexico Highlands that have some very qualified individuals that can go and train and work with through our colleges of education and others that can help and strengthen what we can do in training and working with our public school teachers. When you look at the other issues, um, you, know, you brought up the, the issue on the behavioral health mess. Wow. That, that in itself um, is going to be something for us to truly look at and really think as to where and what's happened in the state of New Mexico. But if you look as to what the Martinez administration has been doing, and this is kind of what I call the MO 
of what she's been doing. When she first came in, if you re will remember, there was the, um, the thought, the accusation that went out to several of our school districts in, in our state that they were gaming the system on special education monies. The audit was done, and what was found? Nothing. A few minor problems, but those were corrected, but nothing to the extreme as to where the Martinez administration and Ms. Scandera had labeled our schools as gaming the system. Then if you remember the issue on the New Mexico Finance Authority, the NMFA, there was an audit that was supposedly done. They came in. They, uh, If you remember also through the, the news, um, there was an arrest made very publicly, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we don't even know what the results of that audit were yet. Wow. Still. But, again, still kind of the same MO that's being used. Right. Now you have this whole issue with the behavioral health system in our state. An audit was done. Information was not released and payments were subsequently stopped, and now you have several of these behavioral health companies in our state that are out of business. They have been taken over by companies from outside of the state. So it seems to be a track record, as I call it, that mm, the governor has been utilizing. You make accusations, there's this audit, you destroy somebody's reputation, and then what? And we still have no idea about what's in with regards to those audits. But when you begin to look and take another step back, the whole issue is about the destruction of the state of New Mexico, our economy, our small businesses, if you look at that. It, it truly gets down with this behavioral health issue. Um, we've heard testimony, and I've been on the Health and Human Services Committee for 16 years. Wow. So and that's an interim committee that meets during the year. And we've heard testimony many a times over about our behavioral health system where it is, where it's gone. We have problems, but what has currently happened has completely destroyed any, what I call, semblance of um, responsibility from the state of New Mexico to our people. And yet she's um, kind of, to me, it's like a for sale sign. You know, New Mexico is for sale. So you have these companies that have come in, you know, they complained on one of the audit um, pieces of information that leaked out that one of the CEOs or whomever was um, in charge of this one company was making close to a million dollars in income. Well, if you look at La Frontera Inc., because I got a hold of that copy, $300 an hour for the CEO. For those of us who know how to extrapolate, add, multiply, however, you could easily bring that up to $600,000 a year. That money is not taxable in the state of New Mexico. That money goes across the border to Arizona. Wow. Many of these companies have had issues even with their health, um, behavioral health care delivery in the state of Arizona. Questions come up of where were these relationships made? When was the contact made in order to have these companies come in to take over essentially New Mexico's behavioral health care system? And we had a, a conference call yesterday um, that I was uh, parlayed to and listening to the concerns that were folks were able to call in through CMS. We had the representatives from Human Services Department as well as the Behavioral Health Collaborative. And many of the stories that were being shared are concerns that I have been hearing from my own constituents and my own community. And as I've been traveling our state, you hear them over and over. It's the continuity of care. Where is the caring for our people in the state of New Mexico? Behavioral health is not something you, you know, you play around with. No. These are people's lives. You work with the counselor. You have a relationship. Now you have someone new in front. You have to build that trust over again. You have to build everything from ground zero. Yes. That destroys people. And one concern that was given to me is that what if, God forbid, that there's an incident, that someone's meds, you know, schizophrenia, mm. whatever the case may be what happens with that instance. But you know, this is not the only, I mean, there's the issue on the developmentally disabled support services waiver. Right. I just um, received some information from the Legislative Finance Committee. I was at their hearing in Chama last week. They have returned $2.8 million back to the general fund this year. And yet they're cutting services. They're cutting, oh my God. they are cutting monies that are going to these families that are in need of services for their children. This, this affects those who could be quadriplegic. Those are those who are developmentally disabled. Um, there are those who are in need of autistic 
you know, they're part of our autistic community. These families need just that extra little bit of money. Yeah. We have many families who are on the waiting list. That's been the argument forever. But yet they're returning $2.8 million? Why? Yeah. Those are so many questions to ask. And you talk about privatizing. It just seems as though people from outside of the state are coming in. They're receiving contracts. They're not even going through the uh, HR system, the personnel system that we have. So you have monies being moved around within state government based on bar requests. Right. Budget adjustment requests is right. what the bar stands for. And they're moving monies around. When they start doing that, they're not going through our personnel system. They're not looking for the qualified New Mexico in people that live here that could be employed and taking some of those positions. They're giving monies to people from out of state. So uh, for those of us who um, who don't spend a lot of time at the legislature, <laughs> could you explain a little bit about what BAR actually is and how that is a, a way to, uh, to sort of do a shell game with with the people's money uh, without anybody knowing about it particularly because nobody watches that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then in regard to that too, I'm wondering what other kind of shell games do you see in the future in terms of that old MO of making an accusation, having an audit, hiding the results of the audit, and then making a movida on, on the Mexicans? The bar. That was something, and I appreciate that question too, um, because that, and for those in our community who don't particularly pay attention to the state budget. You know, you have five point some odd billion dollars and that's how much we approve as a legislature and et cetera. The budget, um, the bar is essentially what it is, is moving money from one account, one line item that is in a particular department's budget, moving it from one section over to another. And that request can be made from the um, secretary's office based on who, whoever her, that's working in hers or his department that's in charge of their overseeing their budget. That request then goes over to the Department of Finance Administration, um, and they have to give some justification as to why they need this um, budget adjustment request. That's what BAR stands for, budget adjustment yes. request. And doing so, and then normally that information then comes to us on the Legislative Finance Committee, and for the most part, at least it's informational so that the legislature also knows where these requests um, for changes of money is moving in from one pot to the other. And that's kind of it. But there was um, just, and the LFC, Legislative Finance Committee, which we say LFC, we don't do very often a uh, uh, kind of a stop and look and listen um, opportunity because you know that's the way the executive works but at least it's the information that comes back to the uh, third level of government I call it the next level of uh, branch of government but recently with regards to this behavioral health issue um, the human services department was in front of our of the legislative finance committee and said that they needed to move some monies around and the initial request had been for a little over seven million dollars well, what came back in front of the Legislative Finance Committee, and we had that discussion in Chama, there was an objection that was made from David Abbey, who serves as our director of the LFC, and it was brought in front of the committee for a full discussion. And that's where it was a 15 to 1 vote for those who are voting members of the LFC to say that they had an objection. And part of the concern was is that first when you would come in front of us asking for $7 million, that you were moving one, from one pot of money to the next to pay for these uh, new companies coming in. Now you need $10 million more? Uh -huh. So why? And that, that sparked some interesting discussion from both the chairman and vice chairman and other members of the committee. But the department still had no real answers, again, as to where and what. Um, the other question that was asked, well, if you're moving $10 million, what are you going to move next time? <laughs> and if you go back and review the contracts that are let to these five different companies out of Arizona, uh, there's, there's, in their scope of work, it ain't much. You can go check yourself. Yeah. Um, there's, it, it's very limited. The contract may say for three months only, but come on, we all know how the system works. You can always get an extension of the contract. Yeah. That's happened for many years over in state government in any face, whether it's state, local. You can always have an extension. 
ask. So stay tuned. There's still more to come out of this. And many of us are asking. In fact, I myself have had an IPRA request to ask from the governor's office, the Department of Finance and, and Administration, DFA, as well as Human Services Department, for any communications that they have had going to Arizona. Because how interesting that these companies are ready, here, willing to take over, to come in, set up shop. It doesn't happen overnight. No. There had to have been some communication before. There had to have been a plan. Right. I've heard some talk in the community, but again, you need substantiation from the paperwork, and I haven't gotten much yet. So, um, more to come down the road. What do you see... Uh, what other areas are going to be uh, accused of malfeasance, audited, um, accused with no with no means of defense, uh, and then more money, more of our taxpayer money going to out-of-state companies? Do you see this as being widening? Those are some very good questions that we have to be very cautious and look. As I've just earlier shared with you, there's three areas already yeah. that have been hit, and there's still more to come. I anticipate that there will be more to come. Um, you can look, you know, even further into the Department of Health. I know that they're cutting budgets also in other program areas. It's just a matter of coalescing and, and getting the information yeah. to see where and what's happening. You know, um, concerns come up still with regards to the Environment Department. Yeah. Um, concerns come up with regards to uh, when you talk about, okay, tourism received a little bit more money. But again, the focus as to where they're going with that, um, you know, they're going with out-of-state professionals again. So it's as though any place they can have an, uh, to squeeze a few bucks, to squeeze a few dollars out of other contracts and such, you seems to be the path leading towards someone from out-of-state getting a nice contract to come in and take care of New Mexico. And it's, uh, you know, I've had some issues that have been brought to my attention that I'll be doing some more research on, too, is the issue of water. In the state of New Mexico, there's some very big concerns that I'm waiting to see as I begin to delve more into that issue, exactly where and what's happening. You know, the, the interstate compacts, there's a lot of issues with that. Granted, it was you know, decided and worked on many years ago, but I think there's some things that we could do to make some amendments to have it studied again as to exactly what we owe Texas. Um, the Ogallala on the east side, there's a lot of issues with what's going on there. It's not, um, you know, there's just, there's not a lot of answers and as I've been traveling the state, the biggest issue on the one of the first questions I get asked is, "What are we doing about our water?" Yes, and that's from northern New Mexico down to the east side of the state, down to Deming. Uh, when you go over to Luna County, Hidalgo County, that's a big question that comes up: What are we doing about water, especially in the state of drought that we're in? Yeah, I'm. I completely agree with you. I personally think that water is the central issue. Uh, in New Mexico this year, next year, the year after next. One of the most powerful figures in the Mountain West is a woman named Patricia Mulroy, who is the head of the, the, uh, uh, the Southern Nevada Water Authority, which feeds water into Las Vegas. Um, they've been doing water planning that makes ours look like, um, like we haven't done anything at all. Now, we know that the water world in New Mexico is full with thousands of people, many experts, most of them grassroots people who've studied these issues, lawyers, all, all manner of things. We still don't have a serious climate change admitting water policy in New Mexico. Uh, we still let Albuquerque drink almost 150 gallons per person in Las Vegas, Nevada, drink 75 gallons per person a day. I mean, it's really preposterous. I'm very happy to hear you talk about water. Could you explain a little bit more about your views and maybe give us a little clue as to what kinds of things you might have in mind to tweak the system a little bit, or even to change it completely? As you said, water is so important for the state of New Mexico. It's just as important as the oil and gas, which brings in money to our coffers for the state. But for this one, it's the lifeline that keeps our communities alive. And when you talk to our Native American communities, when you go speak to the Asequia owners, the farmers, everybody wants a piece of that. But also for those of us who live in Albuquerque, Santa Fe, if you live over in Clovis, you live in Gallup, we all need water in which to live on. Absolutely. That's part of who we are as human beings, Absolutely. animals and everything else. But we have to be very careful for the legislation that we pass. And those are things that I have learned in my 17 years in Santa Fe. 
when the issue of water comes out, you have to pay so much close attention as to what you're doing about water rights. Yes. That's integral to where and what before you can have somebody um, being willing to sell their water rights. Well, do you actually own them? Yeah. And that's been happening many a time over as I hear more stories of how water has been taken away from New Mexico. Those are things we have to be very cautious of. And uh, um, under my administration, we'll make sure that we have, as I call, clear title to make sure where those waters are and who has the jurisdiction over that. But the other fact of the matter is, too, is we have to have a conversation in the state of New Mexico amongst governments. That's the state government. That's your soil and water conservation districts. That happens to be county government, city government, farmers, um, those who you know have the cattle that utilize the, the water also. Those of us who live in the middle Rio Grande area, because we're the largest population, we really have not had a true dialogue amongst ourselves. We talk about a water plan. We don't have one. We really don't talk about conservation, who, to me, which is something that is priority. Mm-hmm. We should be talking about conservation, but you don't see it out there. It's nowhere. Albuquerque has a little bit of a discussion. Santa Fe has had a little bit of discussion, but look what happened to Magdalena Yes. this summer. Yeah. The community was left without water. And it can has the possibility of happening in other places. Yeah. We're not out of the woods yet. Oh, by no means. You know, I did mention, of course, too, about the water compacts. We need to come back to the table and sit down. In the reality that we have with this drought that we're in, we cannot continue to deliver the water that was agreed upon in those compacts years ago to give water to Texas. We don't have that square footage. I call it square footage of water that we're supposed to be giving to the state of Texas. It's nowhere. We just can't keep that. Otherwise, they come back and sue us in court. We go back with them in court, and we'll end up owing millions of dollars, but nothing changes in the allocation of water. That has to be looked at. And I'll be making sure that is brought back to the table. You have to sit down and speak. Even the Colorado River is having issues with what their their water delivery is, too. Absolutely. But, um, you know, again, traveling the state, you have one community that wants, and, and, and I granted, I understand they need that to for their livelihood. But then again, you have everybody else who's clamoring for some of that water. And traveling the state this summer, too, you know, Story Lake up in Las Vegas. I grew up, you know, used to go, and it was full. It's just a little pond. It was sad to see that. Granted, we've had rain, yes, but that's it's just a drop in the big bucket that we have or should I say that we don't have in our state. Conservation is important. We have to have that conversation. We really do. And especially with our younger generations to understand how important it is for us to conserve. We have to and should be doing that, and that should be part of our plan. It's always uh, seemed to me that uh, New Mexico is one of, is perhaps right now, the poorest state in the country. It is terribly vulnerable to all the other people who want our water, who use our water, who are eager to get their hands on it, from California to Arizona to Nevada to Wyoming to Utah to Colorado to Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody, particularly in the Colorado Compact right now, is looking at the Colorado River, looking at Lake Mead and Lake Powell and thinking to themselves, you know, Phoenix is going to have to shrink. And I, I keep on thinking of Las Vegas, New Mexico, who has, you know, the poor Guyanus, you know, which is the smallest stream I think I've ever seen. And they've been in, what, stage five uh, water rationing for, you know, gosh, I think over the last six years, maybe five out of the last six years. They have Mm -hmm. no street trees. Their their, their street lawns are dead. Their park trees are gone. I mean, they're an example of what can happen Mm -hmm. if we don't uh, make a concerted effort to really uh, think about this in a rational Communi- uh, communitarian way. You know, and you bring up some, I think, some points that many people are also thinking out there exactly where and what are we doing. Mm-hmm. It's an environmental issue. It's a usage issue. It's talking about and looking at what our state to the north is doing. Um, you know, even Phoenix itself has some issues coming up. They yeah. just, they're, they're kind of oblivious to it at this point. But that oh, city can only grow so much. Uh, before, again, the oasis in the desert kind of goes poof. Yeah, and it's true. And it, it, it's, it'll be, it's coming. It's not like they're going to live, be able to live in the mode that they are at this point. Um, as you mentioned, Las Vegas, Nevada, they themselves know that there's, there's a, a finite 
uh, source of water, yeah. depending as to where and what happens with our environment, with the, the global climate warming, all of the other issues that are there as we begin to see the change in what we have grown up. You know, seeing when I was growing up here, you, you always had the monsoons that came in. There was always plenty of water. You could live your life knowing exactly where and what, but it's changed. The last 20 years, there's been a complete change as to where and what the expectations are. It's true. It's true. And for Albuquerque, for Las Cruces, for Santa Fe, we may have some opportunities because we do siphon some water up north from what Albuquerque's been able to negotiate and work with, but not every, every community can do so. No, I know. And I wanted to point out one more thing. This last legislative session, there was an interesting bill that was introduced about water. And it, was, it, it didn't come out of the House, which, thank God, it did not. The House of Representatives did their work, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But that was very detrimental as to what that would do with regards to even those of us who have limited water access, exactly how and what you as a community could do in order to um, ask for assistance in doing water planning, and doing a water system for your community. That's a bill that has to go back and hopefully never see the light of day. But there are some concerns being raised as to how the state engineer is going to be working around the system because that's how um, this administration does their job. If you cannot pass a bill, as we did with the public education system, you do by rule, regulation, not by law, but by rule. You do the teacher evaluations. By rule, you do the testing. It's all these issues that they go the back door. Yeah. And the same thing, I have some concerns about what could be showing up through rule, through the state engineer's office also. It's the back door so that we as legislators, as the elected people representing our communities, don't see it till it's too late. So if you're doing everything by rule through the back door, how handy it is to have a government that tries to run itself by private emails. If you're trying to have a, uh, a community discussion about water and you want to subvert it, well, let's just go and use machinery that nobody can get a handle on and make your plans and come back and, and, and present them as if they were done by fiat. And, uh, so transparency, uh, running government the way it ought to be run, in the public eye, uh, how can you do water planning without that? Okay, another area private emails. Uh, in this administration, um, when Governor Martinez ran, she ran on saying she was going to be transparent. Okay, well, I have yet to see that. And I think not just myself, but the public, the media, um, with regards to where's the transparency. You know, the issues um, still existing with in regards to the public education department with Ms. Scandera. There have been a lot of um, private email information that's gone on through there. We still don't have all of that information that IPRA requests have come in, you know, requesting that public information be shared. Um, the issue with regards to uh, um, most recently the, uh, how you say, the uh, casino over here in Albuquerque. Oh, yeah. The Downs at Albuquerque. A lot of information has happened with regards to via email, private email. And IPRA requests have been asked to see some of that information. And the list goes on as to where and what. Do we have another level of government that is operating other than what we can see as the public, what the media sees, and then what they see? So not only do we have 15 local behavioral health organizations, many of whom have been operating for 30 years or more, utterly destroyed their reputations, spoiled, ruined, mm -hmm. uh, by data that they don't even know exists. They can't even contend against them. Uh, not only that, but now we're beginning to see, and I'm beginning to think this is a very, very sort of almost um, dark reality, is that uh, uh, certain forces in our country are trying to make a different kind of government, one that not only undercuts existing government, but that actually operates on its own rules behind the scenes that nobody understands and nobody can fathom uh, because... Uh, because they have no access to it. Um, it seems like that's what's happening here in an odd way. In one of the most political states in the Union, a place where really we know how to play this game, but it's being played on a very different playing field. We have to be vigilant. And that's as legislators, 
as the public, as the media, to really focus and pay attention to what is really happening in our state. And you make a great point. There's another form of government that is running not just our state, but many other communities in across this country as to where and what's happening. Um, they're spoken about in the context that, oh, we're doing the work for you, we're trying to do the work for this. There's all these different wedge issues that are put in the middle and between that gives them cover, in my opinion, for many of the actions that they are doing because people are paying attention to the emotional issue about whatever these wedge issues are. And they're not really focusing on what is going on behind the scene. You know, for me, um, what I've seen these last uh, almost three years is that's not what I subscribe to. That's not the type of government that I feel that I represent. You want something, an entity, whatever people see government as, and I represent government as a as a public official. Yeah, yeah. That's not exactly what my community expects. You make a phone call, you want a real answer. You want to have someone respond to what is happening. You know, that phone call, um, if you want to call a phone call conversation that we had with regards to the behavioral health issue, there were no answers that were given. It was very disrespectful. People calling in, talking about concerns that they had, and there was questioning on the line about, well, really? Giving them a 1-800 number to call yes. to find out service? Yes. No, this is, this is New Mexico. We have a personal relationship with our people. You need to take care of and be respectful and answer them. Not doing as to how that phone call was handled that hour and a half, I don't even know if I'd call it respectful. It was kind of just a pat on the head and say, okay, New Mexico, we're taking care of you and move on. Yeah, and get out of the way. And get out of the way. And that I've seen that. It's within our public education system. It, there's, um, you know, the list is so extensive. We could spend a lot of time <laughs> just going through many of the different facets that I've seen. That is not who New Mexico is. That's not the respect we deliver, that we deserve. And she's not delivering any type of respect to us. It's almost like just walk, walking over us and saying, who? Thank you so much for your candor, your intelligence, your knowledge that you shared with us today. I think it's going to make a, a wonderful um, um, context for our, our listeners and readers and viewers uh, to get a, another handle on what's actually going on right now in our state. It's really a, an unprecedented moment, I think, in our political history. Very grateful to have you here with us, and, and it's been a joy. Thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. What, what our public has to understand is that they have to be engaged. They have to ask the hard questions and just don't accept verbatim what you see on the news, mm -hmm. what you see on the blogs, what you see anywhere, anywhere. You have to go and do your due diligence. You have to call us, ask your elected people, hold us accountable. We should be holding Governor Martinez accountable and ask her the hard questions.